uh, this is, I think, I think you know, we're going to spend a lot of time with this book. Really try to get yourself into this Nicomachean ethics book. Because the final exam is just going to be about it. It's going to be an open, open book exam. So the more you know it, the more you've marked it up, you'll know exactly where to turn to find the answers. <clears throat> And I think it's very nice when you come to a university like Fordham University that you get to read a whole book by Aristotle. You, know, you can talk about this at cocktail party. You tell your boss, that, you know, your boss says, what do you do at Fordham? You can say, I read Aristotle. The boss says, oh, well, yeah, I took a philosophy class. I read a, we had a couple of readings by Aristotle. You can say, no, at Fordham we didn't have a couple of readings. We read the whole book, the whole of Nicomachean Ethics by Aristotle. Everybody will think you're very classy and educated. They'll get you into the gin and tonic and ask you all kinds of questions. Tell us more about Aristotle. It's a hard book to read. I know, it, the, the, it's very hard to read. Why is that? You might say, well, why, why is everything so hard to read in this book? I'll tell you why it is. It's because, truth to tell, Aristotle didn't actually write it. Uh, <clears throat> what he did was he gave lectures to students. You know, Remember, he was Plato's student. And later in his life, Aristotle went off and formed his own school. You can read all about this on Wikipedia. I'm not going to go into all the details here. But Aristotle went and formed his own school, and he gave lectures on philosophy. And he was known for walking around when he taught. He would pace up and down, and sometimes his students would be picky. He'd pace too far, his students would have to walk with him. That's why they called him peripatetic. That's a Greek word. It just means walker. <clears throat> he, was the para, he was the walking philosopher, and he would give lectures. And his students would walk with him, and they would take notes, okay? just like some of you take notes. <clears throat> And the notes were, you know, uh, uh, collected later on <clears throat> uh, by a, a, a monk. I think his name was Alexander of Rhodes. And, you know, imagine if somebody took your lecture, the notes from your lectures, and just tried to, you know, compile a book out. They would read kind of awkwardly. You might be able to get a sense of what I was saying, but you'd have to work a little bit. You'd have to fill out some of the sentences. You'd have to fill in words. And it would be a little bit of a challenge. But you would be able to discern the message. You'd be able to figure out what Kovach said from your class notes if you were writing down carefully. And that's what they did with Aristotle. So you know, you read this, and you say it's kind of awkward the way it works. And that's just because of the, it's just collected class notes from Aristotle's lectures. But you read it carefully, and you try to understand it. And I'll talk a little bit here in a moment about how to study this. But it's a really good book. I've sent a copy of this book to every president who's been inaugurated in my adult life, okay? My first election, I voted in 2000. I was a Bush, Gore, Nader, et al. Uh, and George W. Bush was inaugurated, and I sent him a copy of Nicomachean Ethics. Then in 2009, Barack Obama was inaugurated. I sent him a copy of Nicomachean Ethics. I think it's a good book for any leader, anyone who's in a position of power to study. And I sent it to uh, Donald Trump last year. Maybe I should have sent it to Mike Pence. You know, Mike Pence. I think Mike Pence is literate. <laughs> I've said, I, I said this in a previous class. There's nothing intrinsically, obviously wrong with being uh, politically conservative or being a member of the Republican Party. Maybe it's wrong, but you'd have to give an argument, right? It's just not obviously wrong. Uh, but there is something, I think, very obviously and fundamentally wrong with bragging about sexual assault or bullying people on Twitter, or using very crass language for minorities, okay? If you, if you want to be a, a Republican or be a political conservative, there are virtuous people you can try to imitate. You can read a guy named Russell Kirk. You can, who knows who William F. Buckley Jr. was? Anybody recognize that name? William F. Buckley Jr. Anybody remember him? You remember William F. Buckley? After they started a paper, right? National Review or something? Yeah, uh, that's right. The National Review, I think, was the name of his magazine that he started. And uh, he had a television show called Firing Line. And if you watch it today, I think you'll be very surprised when you watch this show because he's a political conservative. His show was on for like 30 years, from the 60s through the late 80s or something like that. And he would have people of all kinds of different political opinions on his show. Uh, and he was very respectful. He was always very nice and I mean, there's one. Ex there's a famous exception. He had a debate with Gore Vidal. Emotions got kind of high. Okay, but normally, I mean, he had the radical communist poet Allen Ginsberg on his show, and Allen Ginsberg read some of his poetry, and uh, that's that very nice. I like that. And then they would debate about politics. They would go back and forth and try to figure out where their common ground was. And he was always very respectful to the people on his show. You know, 
You had a, a liberal like uh, George McGovern, who was a presidential candidate on the show. He didn't say, you, I think he was just a liberal dummy head. You know, he's so much better than what you see on Fox News or something like that now. It's just people screaming at each other. So, you know, if you're, if you're, a, a politi- if you're politically active, look to see who the virtuous people are. Act like the virtuous people that used to be active in this arena. I think we can bring back respectful political discourse. Aristotle's going to do this in the first book of the Nicomachean Ethics. He's going to talk about all the people who disagree with him. But he's very respectful. He's saying, can I find some truth in what these people are saying? This book can change lives. I, had a, I was working down in South Carolina, and there was a young man who uh, was in a motorcycle accident. Uh, this is happening more and more frequently. You know, the doctors gave him painkillers. Eventually, you know, he was using the painkillers and it got out of control, and he wound up addicted to opioids. If you don't know about this, you should go home and you should Google opioid crisis in the United States. It's very serious. <clears throat> I've seen I've seen estimates that you know a thousand people a week are dying in this country from heroin overdose. In uh, in Ohio alone, which is where I come from, uh, it's very serious in, in poor communities mostly. But this young man was addicted to heroin. Uh, he got himself really in over his head. He was associating with some very bad characters. Uh, and he went to get help. You know, for, if you have a drug addiction, you've got to talk to your doctor, right? This book alone won't help you. But we spent six months, uh, this fellow and I, working through Nicomachean ethics together. He wanted to learn some Aristotle. And he changed his life slowly but surely. He changed his life and he developed better habits. Because this book, in a way, this book is just about addiction. This is a book about addiction. All of us have some addiction, right? Hopefully you're not addicted to anything as powerful as heroin. But all, you know, you might be addicted to gossip. You, know? you might be addicted to talking about people behind their backs and getting a cheap laugh. <clears throat> That's a bad habit. Aristotle's going to say what good habits you can develop. If you're addicted to something, you have to find good habits to replace your addiction. I've read that pornography addiction is very serious right now. Uh, a friend of mine who runs a, a, a seminary said it's a problem with incoming uh, candidates for, for priesthood, that they have pornography addiction. And this is very bad. If you have, if you've heard about this. You know, it's a real thing. Uh, and it affects the same part of your brain as drugs. You know, if you have pornography addiction, you have to find good habits. You have to find wholesome things to watch instead of these, these images. The internet is very hard, it's very easy for a lot of people, I understand, to get involved in this. But this book is about addictions. Good addictions and bad addictions. Aristotle wants us to have good addictions. So what I want to do today is, first of all, give you a bird's eye view. I'm going to tell you what each of the ten books is about. Right? I like to do this when I teach. You know, you've seen me do this. I like to start with a bird's eye view. Get a big overview picture. Nothing too detailed, nothing too technical, just... What's the big picture? This is what, you know, I, on the first day I talked about Thomas Aquinas uh, in that letter on how to study. He says, enter by the small streams. Enter. Don't go diving into the technical stuff right away. Get a big picture of you. Is there any, anybody here an education major? Anybody study? I, and there's got to be a name for this thing I do. You, not you. Is there like a name? Have you heard any, any theory that supports my approach to pedagogy here that I give the big picture first and then slowly zoom in? Sort of? Okay. Um, when, like, I teach this one course, um, like, has to do with, like, government or whatever, it's like, you get all, all these problems and then you, like, narrow it down, it's like an upside down triangle. Oh, yeah, exactly, like an upside down triangle. You have a whole host of things that we got to think about, we're just going to slowly narrow it down. So... <clears throat> So this book is, you know, probably ten lectures that Aristotle gave about ethics. And Aristotle, you know, one thing you have to know about him is he's a scientist. He's one of the first really rigorous scientists. He thought of himself primarily as a biologist. He's out there studying animals. We know that when he died, he left it to his students. He assigned some of his students before he died. Theophrastus, go finish cataloging all the kinds of insects. I read the other day that biologists now, they've, they've... Cataloged over 900,000 varieties of insect. 
Aristotle would have been blown away by that. He probably thought there were like 12 varieties of insects, you know? <laughs> Anybody see that study about the New York subways? That uh, They looked at germs on New York subways. <laughs> Some of them, they didn't even know what they were. They'd never seen this virus before. <laughs> <laughs> it makes you think twice about riding the subway, doesn't it? <laughs> bubonic plague. They found bubonic plague on the New York subways, but not enough to actually be dangerous. Nothing you have to worry about. All these fascinating things I learned when I moved to New York, baby. <laughs> if you drink water from the tap, they put microscopic shrimp in the water here in New York. Did you know this? You're it's true. It actually makes it safer, though. They put these microscopic shrimp in, in water that actually the, the shrimp will eat all the dangerous stuff in the water, all the stuff that actually can kill you. So you should be happy to be getting... Anybody a vegetarian? You're a vegetarian? Who else is you're a vit- do you? Do you have an ethical qualm about uh, drinking... Uh, now, now I'm thinking about it because my mom's vegan. Your mom's vegan? Yeah. You're a vegetarian. <laughs> Can you drink New York water dough knowing that these microscopic shrimp are in there? We're going to read a guy named Peter Singer here in a couple of a couple of days, but uh, Peter Singer is a very strict vegetarian, but he says it's okay to drink New York water because the shrimp can't feel anything. They're too small to have nervous systems. You look like you have a quizzical face about that. Well, we'll talk about it here when we get to Peter Singer. He's a very fascinating guy, very controversial guy. So Aristotle would have just been fascinated by all these kinds of life that we have, all kinds of life around us. And eventually he gets to thinking about human life. Right? We're just animals, according to Aristotle. We're a very interesting kind of animal, but we're, we're, we're a rational animal. No other animal can do calculus. Uh, no, other an- no other animal can say, I, I want to learn the whole universe. I want to invite the whole universe into my mind. Aristotle thinks that's what makes human beings very unique. Human beings alone are capable of saying the whole universe come into my mind. There's nothing in the universe that I am not intellectually receptive to. Everything, I mean, it's just amazing how huge the universe is, you know. There's a a black holes that we're learning about, quasars. And did you know that a, a chessboard has 64 squares and 32 pieces, and you can put those 32 pieces in so many different arrangements on a chessboard that there's more ways of putting 32 pieces on a 64 square board than there are atoms in the universe. Right? Just think about how, how, how complex everything is. So, you know, some animals, some animals seem to have, you know, interesting traits. They can, you know, understand a little bit of language and they can build tools. But only human beings were intellectually open to the whole universe. So Aristotle, the biologist, when he gets to studying humans, he's going to be very interested in this. And he's going to say, you know, well, this is good. How do we, how do we become good at this? How can the human being really do what it does well? And that's the first book. First book, he asks, what is the nature of the good life for humans? The answer is going to be uh, our, our, our happiness. I have a lot to say about that term in a moment. Happiness is defined in terms of virtue and contemplation. Okay, I'm getting kind of tight. Virtue, contemplation, happiness. Okay, I start with the bird's eye view. Let's just go back. What is the nature of the good human life? You know, the nature of a good bird life is to fly really well. Aristotle, you know, he sees cats. He says, what's the nature of a good cat life? A good cat life is just to purr and to, you know, uh, knock the wine glass off the, off the shelf. What's a good cat life? A good cat life is when you're writing your final paper, it jumps up on the keyboard. That's what cats do. It's really good at this sort of thing. We have a lot of cats on campus. 
go to the gym in the morning and they're just all outside the McKinley Center. There's like half a dozen of them now. There's this one orange man, very cute. He's getting fatter, so what do you <laughs> But I feel really bad. You know, it's, uh, I was in there one morning. It was like six degrees out. It was one of these really cold days. They're just meowing right outside the door there. <clears throat> and I, I think they're very cold. They must be cold. But they have fur coats. They don't look like they're in terrible pain. You can have six degrees out, but they've got to be cold. I wanted to let him in, but I don't think anybody would be very happy if we had the caps in the Gimli Center. You're not allowed to have caps in the dorms here, are you? No? When I was at the University of Akron, there was a dorm where some girls stuck a cap. There was one cap in the dorm, and nobody ever knew who it was. So the nature of a good cat life is to meow and to purr. The nature of a good bird life is to fly. Look at those birds out there. They're just sitting there on the tree. They're going to fly in a moment. They're very good birds, right? A very bad bird is one that can't fly. But what's a good human life? A good human life is a life of virtue and contemplation directed towards uh, the word as you dime in the owl. I have a lot to say about that in a moment. Don't get freaked out yet. Book two. Definition of virtue. Okay, so if a good human life is a virtuous life, we have to get a definition of virtue. And it's going to tell us the virtue, virtue is a mean. Virtue is a mean. You might think, oh, that's really easy. I, I'm means my little brother all the time. No, that's not what he means by mean. It's a mathematical term. Aristotle's such a scientist. Who's, who, who knows what a mean is? Mathematical. It's an average, right? It's something in the middle. You know, it's a... Uh, <clears throat> when I give my... Uh, when you do the evaluations for your professors and we look at them, they give us the mean, right? You know, Somebody gives me a top score of nine, and somebody gives me a low score of one, whatever. Well, okay. So somebody thought I was just great, and somebody thought I was just the most awful thing ever. But what's the mean? Okay, so, you know, the mean is maybe seven. Okay, right in the middle. Book three. Book three is going to be a lot of fun, but it's going to come in two parts. The first part, the first five chapters, it's just about the nature of choice. <coughs> Okay, we've got to make some choices if we're going to develop virtues. Right. <clears throat> do I drink water with microscopic shrimp in it? Or do I really commit myself to strict veganism? Maybe, you know, maybe your parents were, you know, very ne negligent giving you uh, whiskey from the time you were 10, you know, so you've got an alcohol problem. Well, do you go to the bar after work, or do you make a different choice? Okay, we've got to make some choices. You know, some choices are very hard. Choices can be very hard, so Aristotle's going to tell us all about what choices are like. Then he's going to give us some examples of virtues as me. Easy examples. Clear examples, that's a better word. Clear examples. Okay, the two examples he's going to give us will be courage and temperance. Aristotle basically thinks there's four key virtues. I'll just give them to you now. I'll probably put them on a quiz at some point. The four major virtues... Courage. And you read about this guy. Right here in the Bronx, you probably read about it. And there was that fire over near Arthur Avenue. Anybody read about the, uh, the soldier, the 
was a soldier. You read about? Do you remember his name? No, I don't Took, I think, a great deal of courage. He ran into the building five times, and he brought out four people. The fifth time, he didn't come out. He died. He was an immigrant. I think he said he was from Ghana. Is that right, Ghana? <clears throat> The President of the United States has some very strong words for what he thinks about immigrants from Ghana. But this guy, I think, is very courageous. He had a great deal of virtue to do this. <clears throat> Temperance. Aristotle thinks these are the two virtues that are easiest to think about when you're first starting this study of ethics. Everybody knows what courage looks like. It looks like the guy who ran into the building and brought out people. And temperance. You know, we, we, you know, if you're not temperate yourself, you may know people who are temperate. <clears throat> I've been trying to become more temperate. You know, I, uh, what does this mean? You know, it means that uh, uh, I used to eat a lot of food. I used to just be a glut. I used to just stuff myself with cheeseburgers and pizza every night. And I never got any exercise. But uh, I also know people who eat almost nothing. You know, just a little bit of vegetables every day, and uh, they, they run marathons every two weeks. I have friends like that. Neither uh, is an example of temperance. Temperance is taking the right amount at the right time and of the right kind of food, uh, of drink, television, sexual activity. You have to take all these things in the right amount, right time, right kind. I have a friend who's a, a, a Jesuit, you know, and he's always joking. He says he, he wishes he could get paid to just watch TV. It's his favorite hobby. He told me that, you know, as a Jesuit, he gets paid just uh, $150 a month, you know? I mean, which isn't bad if you have a place to live and all your food's taken care of. So he's $150 a month that he can do whatever he wants with. And what's he do with it? He pays for his Netflix, his Hulu, his CBS All Access. He just really loves watching television. I think he's a pretty good guy. He's a very good guy. But he's always telling me he wishes he could be a little more temperate with his television uh, uh, habits. Me too. I mean, you know, sometimes after work I find myself, what do they call it, binge watching? <laughs> what do you like to binge watch? Do you binge watch anything? Um, no. The, you know, the, the American version or the BBC? Okay. okay. I've never seen the American version. The BBC version was very funny. Ricky Gervais. It's okay to do this from time to time. What do you need an off day? Or, you know, maybe at the, uh, right after midterms. After midterms, you're going to be very stressed, okay? You've been studying so hard. You know, and it's a Saturday or a Sunday afternoon. Just binge watch Netflix. It'll be very good for you. Watch your favorite shows. But if you're doing it every day, you know, if you're skipping class to binge watch The Office, uh, that's, that's not being temperate. Last year, I finally, I, I, had, uh, I had to go down uh, to Florida to help a relative of mine with some, some uh, issues, uh, some health issues, just driving her back and forth to doctor's appointments and things like that. And uh, I had to go down, so suddenly I didn't have any time to collect work and take it with me. So when I wasn't driving her to doctor's appointments, what did I do? Well, I, I had my tablet with me, and I finally just, during that week, and it took me one week to get through all of Breaking Bad. Who's, who's seen Breaking Bad? Well, who hasn't seen Breaking Bad? You seen, most, most of you haven't seen Breaking Bad. So that's an assignment. You should all watch Breaking Bad because there's a lot of ethical lessons in this show. This is a show. This is a show about a man who goes from being very virtuous to being very vicious. Okay, the opposite of virtue is vice. Yeah, this is a person who had to make choices. Walter White had to make choices. The funny thing about this show is this show is very interesting because every time Walter White has a, to make a choice, you can almost sympathize with the choice he makes. You can see why he may have made that choice instead of another choice. And yet, every one of these choices brings him closer, not to virtue, but to vice. And it ends up, at the end of the show, he's not leading a good human life. He's not happy. He's miserable, in fact. Okay? <clears throat> it leads to his ruin. This is a show I think Aristotle would have liked Breaking Bad quite a bit. Aristotle would have been a big fan of Breaking Bad. When Aristotle needs a break from lecturing about biology, he would have binge-watched Breaking Bad on Netflix. I know this for a fact. Then we get to two virtues that Aristotle thinks are just... He just thinks the world of these two. Justice. 
you're a just person. Aristotle's just gonna, he's just gonna say you've done it. You've really got it going. You're just. And, you know, I'm having, having dinner with a friend of mine. We were at a Denny's. <laughs> we were taking a road trip. We were at a Denny's in Indiana. I love Denny's. <laughs> I only ever eat Denny's on road trips. <laughs> they don't have them around here. They've got those egg scrambles. They're so greasy, delicious. And uh, the waitress brings us, uh, you know, brings us back the bill. And she accidentally gave us too much change. Instead of bringing back, like, a dollar and, and like, some nickels, she brought back a $5. She must have just been in a hurry and put in the wrong bill. And my friend said, oh man, this is our day, we got five extra dollars. And I said, no sir, that's not just. That's not just, we have to give it back, that's not ours. So justice is the virtue by which you only take things that belong to you, that you have a right to. Okay? <clears throat> You know, you could win every every uh, football game if you just break into the opposite team in the room and put laxatives in their Gatorade, right? <laughs> They're going to lose. But that's not a just way of winning, right? That's not a that's not a victory earned. And the last one is a virtue that's usually called prudence. It might be thought of as common sense, good sense. We'll call it good sense. And even more broadly than that, it's just virtues of the mind, intellectual virtues. Virtues of the mind. Aristotle thinks that if you have justice and intellectual virtues, he thinks you can do no wrong. The problem with Aristotle is, you know, he says, you know, I mean, it's not a problem, it's actually, I think, a strength. But he says, you've got to give yourself some time. You start now, you start when you're he would have said, you know, 15, 16, 18, but you know, also 18, 20 years old. This is when you start making choices that lead to virtues. But no one in this room is virtuous right now, including yourself, including myself. The best we can be doing is trying to get to virtue. He says it takes 20, maybe 30 years to really become virtuous. What you're hoping for is that by the time you're 50, you've got all four of these just in your DNA, right? It's just in your blood. It's not even a it's not even something you have to try about anymore. <laughs> Aristotle thought, you know, look, if you're 50 years old, if you're 50, 55 years old, and uh, you're still, you know, struggling with, you know, making choices, you know, he says, well, you should have gotten to start earlier. You should have started earlier. So at the end of book three, he's going to start start us, get us started on thinking about these four big virtues, courage and temperance. What does he say in book four? Book four, he gives a lecture and he says, look, I know, I know you're young. You're, these are hard things to do. Difficult life to live, especially when you're 18, 20 years old. How do you get started? The beginner's virtues. There's sometimes called the, the minor virtues. There are virtues for minors. Beginner's virtues. Moral virtues. <coughs> What's this about? He's going to say, well, are you generous? You know? <clears throat> I always try to keep an extra dollar on me or some change, you know, just a handful of change in my pocket. Because here in New York, you're not going to walk very far without somebody asking you for a bit of change. Well, you can do that. You know, you probably have a change jar at home. You know, just take a few, take a little bit out every morning. And when you see people who need something, you can help them out. This is just an easy virtue. <clears throat> he said, "Can you throw a good party? Can you throw, this is a good beginner's virtue to throw a good, not an over-the-top party, not you know a gaudy party. You know, don't, don't turn your house into the Playboy Mansion. But also, don't be, don't be, you know, don't throw a lousy party." Don't just buy a, you know, a case of Diet Coke and cheap Miller Lite. You know, that's not a good party. You've got to have you know, some pizza, you know, maybe 
be a, some microbrewery. I don't know, even, I should be careful here. I can never remember if my ethics students are over 21 or not. If you're under 21, don't have any alcohol at your party. But if you're over 21, you know, throw a good party with some decent microbrews. Don't get wasted. You know, just have, make sure everyone has a nice time. These are the beginner's virtues for Aristotle. We'll talk about a lot of them when we get there. You're going to like that book, I think. Book five, right in the middle of the Nicomachean Ethics. Now, they think he may have been giving these lectures primarily for the benefit of his son. You know why we think this? Because we know what his son's name was. He noticed Nicomachus. He may have been giving uh, lectures to Nicomachus and his friends when they were about 18 or 20 years old. So right in the middle of these lectures, he's going to go off on a big one, the big one, justice. Aristotle just loves justice. He loves them. What is this? You know, well, who was his teacher? Plato. Plato's teacher was Socrates. Socrates was always going around Athens asking, what is just? What is justice? Is this just? Is it just for you to exploit labor? Is it just for you to keep five dollars that the waitress brought you on accident? So that got transmitted to Aristotle. Aristotle just has so much great things to say about justice, both personal and political. I think we're going to spend a couple of days on book five. Because he wants to know, you know, personal justice. Do you cheat on your spouse? This is a question of justice, right? Your spouse has a right to have you as an exclusive partner and lover. So if you cheat on your spouse, you've done something unjust. But there's also political justice. Justice as it governs the whole state, the whole country. Right? Should the government be allowed to execute should the government provide housing or education or health care? What do you do about issues like abortion? Okay, these are all politically just questions about political justice. And so we'll have a lot to, to read uh, when we get to book five. I mean, really, if you're... If you're <laughs> I, I keep begging you. I'm begging you to study this book. And uh, if, if in your mind you're saying, no way, man, I'm not reading Aristotle. I'm begging you then, you know, if you're really that, if you're that dead set against me, if you hate Aristotle so much, just at least take a look at book five. It's such a beautiful book. There's so much to be learned there. Well, if justice is the, uh, the first of the uh, big ones, right? The ones that he wants you to love, the ones that he's you know, maybe he gave all these lectures to Nicomachus and his friends because he just wanted Nicomachus to become a just person. But of course he also thinks, you know, he's a biologist. He likes smart people. So he wants he wants his son and his friends to also have the intellectual virtues. Have some common sense and to know, you know, gullibility. <laughs> Don't be gullible. Don't you? Anybody ever heard of this guy named David Icke? I think it's I C K D, something like that. He's got all these YouTube videos. If you want a good laugh, watch his YouTube videos. But he's actually quite serious. He gets mad when people laugh at him. You know what he's saying? He's saying that Fordham University because it's a Jesuit school, is being secretly controlled by trans-dimensional lizard people. It's true. You can find this guy's videos. That's what he's saying. He's got pictures of what the trans-dimensional lizard people look like. And that they control the Jesuit order in Fordham University because they're organizing a worldwide coup d'etat. Unless you join his army to fight the trans-dimensional lizard people, 
He thinks you're all going to be enslaved by the Jesuits, by the lizard people, who have to do their bidding. And there's people who believe him. There's people who watch these videos and say, oh my god, I was almost going to send my daughter to boredom. I'm still waiting for my check from the lizard people. <laughs> Trust me, if this were true, I'd have a much nicer apartment. Don't be gullible, right? Develop some virtues to know what to believe and not believe. If you think this is over, I mean, you can, maybe you're, maybe you're not even skeptical of what I'm saying. You know, well, no, go check it out. It's really out there. What's the opposite vice? You know, if you're gullible, you might just be too skeptical. You never believe anything at all. You turn on the news, and the news says, you know, an immigrant from Ghana ran into a building and saved five people, and the first thing you say is, fake news. Everything is fake news, right? Nothing, is, nothing anyone is saying is true. Every single news report about anything whatsoever is false. Maybe you're a skeptic. But, you know, we're going to talk, we're going to talk in a few weeks about how to develop virtues of discernment. Jesuits are, Jesuits are really big on intellectual virtues. They, they call it St. Ignatius writes about discernment. The virtue of discernment. Knowing how to make good common sense choices. Oh, okay, maybe you think this is all really great, Aristotle. This, this sounds... This sounds nice. This sounds like a nice life. I like the idea of becoming a person who will one day just... I'll be courageous and temperate. You know, I'll no longer be enslaved to... Facebook and my cell phone. I'll no longer be enslaved to uh, my passions. I'll, I'll be just to everyone. I'll treat everyone the way I'm supposed to. I'll be able to make all these good decisions, and I'll be I'll be intellectually fulfilled. That sounds just great, Aristotle. But come on, it's hard, isn't it? How am I going to do that? I've already got enough on my plate. You know, I'm trying to. Trying to keep my job and raise a family. <clears throat> and, you know, I've already got these bad vices. You know, I mean, maybe when you were young, you know, your friend showed you pornography and you've got pornography addiction or you've got opioid addiction. You know, all these things that are just weighing us down every day. And, you know, you work long hours and you have to go home and maybe it's hard to work on cultivating these virtues. You just, want to, you just want to relax and watch Hulu. Watch, you know, whatever. When am I going to find time for this? So, Aristotle says, I understand this is difficult. Let me give you some practical advice on overcoming vices. Everything in this book is so practical. This class is meant to be very practical. Philosophy of human nature, and maybe you didn't get anything practical on it. Hopefully, this class you know, will be more practical for you. I'll try to tell you what Aristotle says about overcoming vices. It is hard at first. He's going to say it's hard at first, right? You're going to have to do the opposite for a while. <clears throat> you know, if, you, uh, <clears throat> if you're an alcoholic, if you're drinking too much, uh, for a while you just have to not drink at all. You have no alcohol for a while. If you're inclined to sleep too much, you know, sometimes you have to cut back. If you say, okay, well, get up extra early for a while. Do something in the moment. Get up extra early so I can exercise. Something like that. <laughs> then he gives two books to a very interesting... It's very interesting that Aristotle talks about this for two whole books. The Usefulness and the Virtuous Life of Friendship. Advice about friendship. Pursuing this kind of life will be kind of difficult. He says, make it easier for himself by doing it with a friend. Work with a friend on developing virtues. Some of you probably already, you know, you have a training partner? No? You just train alone? Uh, I mean, only if we don't have, like, mandatory this, then yeah, let's go. Oh, yeah, yeah. 
you know, a lot of people who lift weights like to have a training partner. It really helps. It, Arnold Schwarzenegger, I read his book, The Education of a Bodybuilder. And he says it's very helpful when you're getting into this if you do this with a friend. And he says you can challenge each other. You can say, okay, whoever does the most bicep curls today, will, uh, the, the other person has to buy a pitcher of beer. Right? This is what he advises. He says <coughs> his, his partner was a guy named Columbo. Franco Columbo, who uh, <coughs> was actually also, I mean, even though it was his friend, it was his competitor in the early bodybuilding contests, right? They were actually, but they trained together, right? Well, when we're training for virtue, we can train together. Aristotle's going to have a lot of advice about it. When you're studying, get a study partner, right? It's very nice. He's got two old books about friendship, and then finally, Book 10. This is a very mysterious... Some people don't read Book 10. We're going to read Book 10. Because he starts... He kind of gets a little scattered. He starts by talking about the role of education and laws. Then he gets very interested. He starts talking about contemplation and happiness as a kind of mysticism. Aquinas loved Book 10, the Nicomachean Ethics. Aquinas said, you know, you develop all these virtues, and what does it let you do? What will all these virtues really let you do at the end of the day? He says, you'll come to ask the question, why is there anything at all instead of nothing whatsoever? And having realized just how mysterious that question is, why anything at all? <clears throat> Trying to figure out the answer that your mind can't possibly get to will lead you. It will lead you to want to develop a society based on friendship. We don't live in a society based on friendship. We live in a society based on exploitation and alienation. We're alienated from each other right now. You can see it very much in, in politics. Everyone is suspicious. Everyone is very trying to protect their own turf. People are afraid to open themselves up to friendship with others. Friendship involves a kind of vulnerability. You have to be able to see the good in another person to be their friend. You have to recognize that everyone around you has some goodness in them. Even the worst people in the world, there's so much goodness in them that we have to be able to open ourselves up to. And Aristotle thinks that once you have all these virtues, we'll be able to start developing a society based on friendship and contemplation. So, you know, I'll put this online on Blackboard for you to read. Yeah, but <clears throat> don't lose sight of the big picture when you're reading this book. You're going to, you know, get to some pages in this book and there's going to be big sentences. Yeah, and, and weird phrasing. So, some weird stuff. It's a hard, hard book to read because it's just, you know, these fragmented lecture notes. I understand. So how do you study Nicomachean Ethics? Given all that I've just said, now that we have the big picture in mind, the bird's eye view, as I call it, the upside down triangle, <clears throat> how do you proceed? Well, proceed one book at a time. Just take one book at a time. Don't try to read the first three books today. And this is why it's important to start early, right? Because, you know, you're going to want to know this book for the final exam. And if you start reading it, the week before, it's just going to be too hard. You've got to take it in small chunks. And you'll see each book each book of this is divided into chapters, so you know, even to just take chapters at a time. Take a book or a chapter at a time. And what you want to do is at the end of each section or each chapter or each book, first of all, write down the topic of the book. What is the main theme? What's Aristotle's main point in whatever chunk you've chosen? It? It's a book or just a few chapters. Then the goal for each book is to write down five to ten key points. Five to ten key points from each book. Underline the sentences or highlight the sentences that illustrate that key point.
so that by the end of the semester, you will have learned between 50 and 100 key points, key takeaways from the Nicomachean Ethics. So, book one, what's the theme? What's the topic of book one? What's the, what's the big point of book one? It has to do with, I'm going to give you a Greek word. I have to do this. I have to give you a Greek word. The word gets translated as happiness in most of the text. Sometimes it gets translated as flourishing. I have to get these bilingual editions because I want you to always keep in mind that you're not reading somebody who wrote in English. It's very important to know that about Aristotle. Having the Greek right there, at least keep that you know, kind of in the back of your mind. Here's the Greek word. It's very fancy. Eudaimonia. Diamonia. How does it get translated? Some people translate it as happiness. Some people argue it's better translated as flourishing. The problem with translating is happiness. Is happiness, you know, happiness is like, you know, happiness is a warm gun, as the Beatles said. You know, it's just everywhere. <clears throat> it's too common. It's too, it's too fickle. Yesterday I was happy, you know, yesterday I was happy, I was, you know, at Denny's, and I was just so happy to be at Denny's. Mm -hmm. Today, you know, I come back here and it's cold. <coughs> I'm not so happy anymore. That's not what Aristotle means. He's not talking about that kind of fleeting happiness. You know, you're so happy to go to Geauga Lake. Geauga Lake's an amusement park in Ohio. None of you have been there. <clears throat> He's talking about something very permanent, and something that comes really at the end of your life. At the end of your life, have you achieved your diamond eater? When you're on your deathbed, can you look back in your whole life and say, that was a good one. I flourished. I did it well. So, book one, Aristotle says that the aim of life is eudaimonia. And what's interesting is Aristotle says that, believe it or not, every decision you make is made because you're trying to achieve eudaimonia. Every decision you make, you make because you're trying to achieve eudaimonia. You want me to prove it? job, probably, you know? <clears throat> you know? You want to go, you want to <clears throat> go run a non-profit or get a job or whatever. Why? Because, well, maybe someday you're thinking you're going to have a family and you want to be able to support them and have a nice life for them, or at least for yourself. Because you're realizing that if you don't do these things, you know, someday you're going to die and you're going to look back and there's nothing there. So everybody, everybody you know, do this exercise. Take out a piece of paper. I want you to imagine if you know you, you find out you want a sweepstakes, you want ten million dollars in a sweepstakes. What would you do with the ten million dollars? Just write down, be specific, what you would do with your ten million dollars. All the things you would do, as many things as you could think of. order you would do them in.
wants, wants, to, wants to share their list? Somebody tell me what they wrote down. Somebody, you, didn't, you didn't finish yet. Just give us a, give us a start on what you did. Oh, yeah. What would you, yeah, what would you do with $10 million? Um, first, I'd pay off all my college loans. Pay off all your college Right, because... And then those for my brother. And then those of your brother. Yeah. Yeah. And then help my mind. <laughs> and then after that, um, I said that I would like make my parents retire. Okay. Give your parents a And then we take a family vacation around Europe. Okay. Oh, that was nice. Okay. I mean, you still have plenty left over after that, I assume, because, you know, I mean, unless you have $5 million, it's too... I know Fordham's expensive, but it's not that bad. Uh, so, okay, what are you doing these things for, right? Well, you know that debt is a terrible thing. Debt is very... It really stops you from living a full life sometimes, right? Especially <clears throat> when you think about the things you want to do, and you think, well, I can't do that because I have this debt that I'm paying off. So you really want to free yourself. You want to make yourself freer to pursue a different kind of life, right? And the same for your brother. You want your brother to have a better life. And then you know your parents. You want your parents to have some leisure. Aristotle thinks leisure is very important. It's very important to have some leisure time to pursue these, uh, the life that we want. This is all about eudaimonia. The kind of life you... And he thinks all of our decisions are aimed at it. The question is figuring out which kinds of decisions we can make that will get us there. But what kind of life is eudaimonia? Aristotle says there's been three basic opinions here. There's been three opinions. The first opinion is that eudaimonia consists in pursuing a life of pleasure. Maybe you think that a good life is just a life where you sleep with whoever you want and drink and eat whatever you want and so you know, have the best grade marijuana. Maybe that's what you think a life of pleasure is. Aristotle says, well, you know, you know who has that kind of life? Bears, monkeys, dogs. Aristotle says, look, you're not a bear or a monkey or a dog. That can't possibly be the good human life. What's good for the bear, the monkey, and the dog can't possibly be what a human being wants. So Aristotle rules that out. He says that. Next week we're going to read J.S. Mill. J.S. Mill disagrees with Aristotle. J.S. Mill says, look, the life of pleasure really is what we're going to be pursuing. Or not, I mean, it says pleasure in general, actually, but we'll worry about that next week. That's why I put J.S. Mill right after book one of the ethics. It's for contrast. What's the second opinion? How about the life of honor? Some people say, well, you know, maybe it's just, you know, to be respected, to get respect from others. Well, Aristotle says, well, here's the problem. If you want honors, you should want honors because you are good. Here's his proof. Here's how he proves it. You know, I, I, I've got lots of honors. You know, I mean, I got a phone call. And they said, Kovash, we're giving you the Bronx Citizen of the Year Award. You are the Bronx Citizen of the Year. And I said, this is, this is just wonderful. I can't believe I'm being honored as the best citizen in, in all the Bronx. I, I mean, I, I was so happy. And I, I said, well, wait, but, but who is this? It's the Mafia. I don't want to be honored by the Mafia. Those guys kill people. Those are bad people. I mean, I stole a car in Brooklyn once, but, you know... I want to be honored by the mafia. Then one time, the chair of my department, Stephen Grimm, he, he called me up. He said, Kovach, we're honoring you as the best philosophy professor of the year. You're a philosophy professor of the year, Kovach. I said, that's wonderful. I'm so happy, Mr. Chair. What? I, I, I didn't know I was doing so well at my job. What did I... What? How, how did I get... I mean, there's so many other wonderful professors in this department. Why me? They said, well, you know, the union rules say everybody has to get the award at least once, and everybody else has already gotten it. Okay, so I'm being honored by somebody I respect. I have a lot of respect for the chair of my department, but not for doing anything good. He's just, uh, it's just, uh, doesn't mean anything, this particular honor. Well, then, but you can imagine, you know, it's like <clears throat> when Pope Francis visited New York, it would have been a great honor if he said, I just want to point to what Kovach is doing. He's doing a good job. <laughs> Well, here's a very honorable man, and he's actually saying it for the right reason. He says, well, you know, it's good to teach philosophy. 
And it's good to, good to be concerned with what you do. So, okay, now you're being honored by someone good for doing something good. But notice that the life of honor itself is not good. It's only good insofar as you're being honored for doing good. So the third kind of life that Aristotle considers is the virtuous life of contemplation. Pursue the virtuous life of contemplation. Aristotle says that's the good life. The good, the life that aims at eudaimonia. To really achieve eudaimonia, you have to pursue a virtuous life of contemplation. What does that mean? Of course, he's not. Nice. He's got nine more lectures to get through. He says, listen to the next nine things, nine lectures I have to say, and then you'll understand how to pursue a virtuous life of contemplation. And if you do what I'm prescribing, then when you're very old and on your deathbed. You're going to be able to look back at your life and you're going to be truly happy. Not the kind of happiness you get when you're at Denny's, the real happiness, the the achievement. You flourish. People will look at your life and they'll still say, that was a good one. Maybe some of you know people like that. You know, you think about your grandparents or somebody who, you know, lived a long life and they had moderate success and they were always just good people. They lived a virtuous life, they did it right. Remember, the slogan for virtue ethics is do what the good person does. There are people who, at the end of their life, they look back and they say they flourish. That was the good person. Do what they do. Here's another argument that Aristotle gives to prove this. This is called the function argument. I'd like you to all know the function argument. I'd like you to all know, so I'm going to get a better marker to put it up here. I want it actually right. What's the function of a marker? What's, what's this thing's function? To write. It's to write well, right? That one wasn't writing so well. It's kind of faint. A good marker, a good marker, is capable of excellent performance of what it's supposed to do. See, this one's so much better. It's so much bolder. The thing is good if it's capable of excellent performance of what it's supposed to do, of what's distinct to what it's supposed to do. Okay, a bad marker is one that doesn't write well. A bad bird is one that, one that can't fly. Okay, the second premise in this argument is a, if a thing is capable of uh, excellent performance, Well, let's 
distinctive about human beings? Okay, what's distinctive about pen is that when you write, what's distinctive about human beings is our rationality. I know my handwriting's a little sloppy today. Now just think about it for a minute, okay? Even if you can't, if you're having trouble with the handwriting, it'll be online. But what's distinctive about us is what I said at the very beginning of the class. Human beings are able to open ourselves intellectually to the entire universe, okay? This, the infinite vastness of the universe, including why it exists at all. Only human beings can do this. Black holes and quasars and birds and bats and societies and math and calculus and Latin and Greek. The whole universe our minds are able to take in. Only humans are able to do this. So if a human being is good, we perform with our relevant virtues, just like a pen is good if it has the ability to do what it does. And since eudaimonia, Aristotle's proved eudaimonia, is the good of human life, a good human life is one performed with human virtues. Good human life is one performed with human virtues. Okay. I've kind of rushed the function argument, but you know, it'll be on, uh, look, I've already, I've already typed it up. It's going to be a PDF. It'll be on the blackboard, so you can all read it over for yourselves. I promise you. I had to rush it a little bit here because we're running kind of time, and I want to make one more point about book one of the Nicomachean Essays. I had seven originally, you know. But in fact, ethics isn't a precise science. It's not like math. Aristotle says, be generous. And if you say, well, how generous? How much money should I give? Should I give $48 or $49 to the poor? Aristotle says, no, no, you're mistaken. Ethics is a precise science. Ethics isn't going to be a precise science. Why? Because he, Aristotle is very big on this point. Human beings are social, political animals. We live in societies. We have to function in a society. There's a wonderful philosopher named Jacques Maritain. He wrote a book called The Person and the Common Good. Maritain, you know, he also wrote, Maritain helped draft the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights after the Second World War. Maritain was very influential in this. He said, look, humans are intrinsically political, social animals, so we're going to have to figure out what kind of rights we have in virtue of being human. And he said, where do you go to get some starting points on this? He says, we've got to go back to Aristotle. We've got to go back to the Nicomachean Ethics. So this is... There's, you know, I, I listed out seven points to take away from book one. You know, if you're having trouble reading this book, go online and look at these notes. Make sure you understand the function argument. I'll just type it out online. I'll probably ask about it on a quiz at some point. <clears throat> Are there any questions about book one? Any questions about where we're going with this? Who's presenting on Tuesday? Okay. So, you know, on Tuesday we're going to look at somebody who disagrees with Aristotle. He's going to say, no, no, it's not a life in accordance with virtues aiming towards contemplation. We're going to read somebody, Mill, who thinks the good life is the life of a life that pursues pleasure for the whole world. So, have a nice weekend. Try to be virtuous. Uh, this is, I think, I think you know, we're going to spend a lot of time with this book. Really try to get yourself into this Nicomachean Ethics book. Because the final exam is just going to be about it. It's going to be an open, open book exam. So, the more you know.